Okay, you don't have to copy this, it's already in your notes. The last example we did was that problem up there. And I want you to realize that what you're doing tomorrow in lab is exactly like this problem, okay? But you're going to physically do it. And if you look at this problem, you're told the initial concentrations, and you're going to be told the initial concentrations of the two chemicals you're adding together, iron nitrate and potassium dioxide. You're going, to be, you're going to know those concentrations by reading the bottom, okay? The hard part's going to be determining the concentration of a guy at equilibrium. That's what I'm going to talk to you about how we're going to do today. Right? And um, so basically, this is the lab we're doing. You don't have to really take, uh, there's no notes to take here in the beginning. The notes are going to be on the back, last two pages. You're going to be taking some notes on in that lab report. Okay? So in this lab, again, you're not writing this down. You don't have to. Uh, just just kind of watch. This is the, the purpose of this lab. You're going to add two chemicals together. And all I'm going to write down is the net equation, the net ionic equation here, where the iron ion plus three ion gets together with the FCN ion and makes FESCN. Actually, it's really iron nitrate. This is iron nitrate, and this is potassium diocyanate. Now, if you look at both of these, you'll see that even though this is a bottle's got a label on it, it's clear. And if you look at this guy, you'll see he's clear and colorless. Both of these guys are clear and colorless, but the product they make is not. Let me show you. All right? If I take some of this stuff, and you're going to do this tomorrow, all right, only you're going to do it very accurately. We're going to use pipettes and stuff. So I'm adding a little bit. I don't want to add a lot because I don't have a lot. But a potassium thiocyanate. And you can see even better now that it's a clear solution. Okay? Now, when I add to that just one drop, you're going to be using these things to add them, measuring exact amounts using these pipettes. Okay? You'll be using these tomorrow, but let me just use a little disposable pipette and show you what is going to happen if I add these guys together. Let's take a little bit of this stuff. And if I just add a drop or so into there, you've seen this color before, actually. It's a red color. Okay, I just put two drops in, and it got pretty deep red. Okay, We've used this, we, I've used this reaction, believe it or not, as a generic example of what happens in a chemical reaction back in Chem 1. I've, I've, I think there, was at least, there were at least two labs where, you know, I was using this as an example of a color change, all right? Uh, so you've seen that red color before. Now, the difference is going to be, a lot, well, there's a lot of differences. You're going to measure exact amounts, you're going to do it multiple times, and you're going to uh, do multiple dilutions of it. That's why I've got all these test tubes that you guys cleaned yesterday. All right, all these test tubes are laid out, one through five, and there's also uh, four beakers back there as well. So... We'll talk about the actual procedure parts of it tomorrow. I don't want to get to any more of the procedure today. I want to talk about how we're doing it, the actual uh, theory behind this. Well, first of all, the, the uh, equilibrium theory behind it. You know what we're going to do. I will measure, I, I'm sorry, I won't measure, I'll read the concentrations of these guys. All right, so that will be my initials. I'll know that. You don't have to write this down. There's, there's a chart like this starting in your uh, lab calculations. You'll have the change, and you'll have the equilibrium. Now, <laughs> you'll know these guys' concentrations, but we'll read this one. We need this other piece of information here. Now, in reality, you can't just read those bottles. Those bottles are going to be, by the way, very small numbers. This one here, 0 0.002 molar KSCN. This one here, 0 0.2 molar FeNO3. But... I'm, you know, tomorrow you're going to learn why you're not really going to use those exact numbers. You know, well, you can probably tell me right now. If I add some of that to some of that, will their concentrations still be 0 0.002 and 0 0.0? No, because they'll be diluted by the other solution being added to it, right? So we'll worry about those dilution factors later. But you can tell their concentrations pretty easily. Uh, you'll know that uh, this is going to be around 0 0.20 molar, and it's going to be around 0 0.002 molar. And I'll talk about why that's not exact, but we'll have to dilute it. But the hard part is getting this one. How do we get the concentration of the product? Because once they react, it forms an equilibrium. And the amount of FESCN, I can tell by the fact that there's going to be a red solution in there. That guy's red. The other guys are clear. I can measure his concentration by seeing how red he is. That seems crazy. I can't tell. There's no numbers associated with red. Actually, there is. That's what we're going to be learning how to do. 
but it's the exact same problem as this problem we just did yesterday in the, in the notes. Okay, same exact thing. If you want to look at that before tomorrow, you might want to, because we're going to be doing some of those calculations tomorrow. How do we measure the red? How do we measure how red something is? Okay, well, that's kind of weird. What's the matter? Yeah, that thing right there. Yeah, you're looking back at it. That is oh, called a spec 20. It's this thing right here. Okay? And uh, a couple of things I need to tell you. Remember, I'm talking about the theory behind this now. I want to show you how this works, why it works, all right, and how you use it. Go through all of that stuff with you. All right? But we'll go back to the, um, the color, first of all. Things that we see as red, one of the things you may notice, I can adjust that thing to measure a specific wavelength of light. So these wavelengths correspond to colors. You should remember that from Chem 1. You know, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, go from 700 nanometers down to 400 nanometers. So something at, that's red, that appears red, you might say to yourself, okay, well, I'll set my dial to 700 nanometers. Actually, it doesn't work that way. If it appears red, what's it doing to the red light? It's not absorbing it, is it? It's reflecting it, right? So things that appear red, I actually want to set, and by the way, it, de it depends on the actual chemical, but you're going to usually set it somewhere else where it actually is absorbing, the, 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 the wavelength is absorbing the best. And I can show you wavelengths like that, um, and we'll set that wavelength dial. Here, this is a nice little schematic of it, all right? That wavelength dial I will set ahead of time to be at the wavelength that that iron thiocyanate happens to absorb the best, because that way we can get the uh, best reading for how red it is, how deep of a red it is, how concentrated it is. Turns out that the deepness of the red, the, the color red that's in there, is directly proportional to the concentration. And that makes sense, doesn't it? The, the more of it I have, the deeper red. If I add, right now you can see I can see through that. I could add a little bit more, and it'll get even darker and darker. And basically, it can even get opaque if I had enough concentration of both of them. It could be opaque. All right, not when using probably 0.002 molar of this stuff, but I have con higher, more higher concentration stuff back there. All right, so you'll all have this knob. You'll never touch this knob tomorrow. It'll be set at 470, I believe, is it, is it wavelength. This, all these other knobs, I'm going to show you how to use. I'll worry about showing you how to use those knobs tomorrow. You're going to put your sample in here, and you're going to have, you're going to, it's going to read it. It's going to pass a light through it, and it's going to read the absorbance of it. But let's go through the actual theory behind what's going on, okay? Here's what's happening. Inside that machine, think of there being a, a prism. What does a prism do? Well, a prism disperses the light. The, the purple light, in this case, is traveling slower through the prism, through the medium, than the red light is, all right? And so if you look down here, all these lights travel at slightly different speeds through this medium. All different wavelengths do. And therefore, you separate white light. You separate white light out into its different colors. Roy G. Biv. Okay? Now, what you have inside that machine back there is basically a prism. It may be a diffraction grating, probably is, but in the old ones it probably was an actual prism. And if I rotate that prism the correct way, I can block out all the other colors but the one I want to go through. All right, so I'll just be shining a specifically a purple light or a blue light or a green light or a yellow light through my sample. So I can actually determine exactly what wavelength to send through that by twisting that little um, prism. Okay, this is another schematic of the inside of it. It's actually, um, this is probably a more accurate one, but this is easy to understand. So let me talk about this one. There's a light bulb inside that machine. That light bulb shines through a slit onto a, we'll say a prism, maybe a diffraction grating, which can be rotated or turned until it has only a specific color shining through the sample. You see it? On the other side is a detector. It doesn't have that over here, but over here it does. After there's a detector, a measuring photo tube, it measures how much of that light goes through, how much of that specific wavelength of light goes through the sample. And it's measured on a meter, a meter just like this. Now, the new ones today, those of you who are in uh, AP Bio or will take AP Bio, Mrs. Um, or Ms., uh, or Rothery has a, a spec 20. It looks just like that one, except instead of a dial, it has a digital readout. All right, but it does exactly the same things. All right, and you're gonna you're gonna pass your light through here, and there's actually the scale actually has two parts to the scale. The top one is this transmittance. I'm pretty sure our scale goes from uh, 100 over here. Let me see. 
You don't have to break this down. 100 over here to zero transmittance over here. And the bottom of the scale is going to be absorbance. Now think about it. If 100% is being transmitted through, what would the absorbance be? Zero. And over here would be some other number. It's not what you might think. I'm going to talk about the relationship. It's a little more complicated than you might think. But in, in general, the uh, um, relationship between uh, absorbance and transmittance is inverse. It's an inverse proportion. Okay. All right. So we will measure. We're going to measure absorbance. It turns out absorbance is the one that's directly proportional to the uh, concentration, which is which makes sense. The stronger the absorbance. The more color is there, the more of that wavelength that's being absorbed, the more particles are, are, are blocking it from getting through. Therefore, the more concentrated it is. That just makes sense, right? All right. So that's how the machine works. I got to now talk to you about what I'm, I'm going to go over this, by the way. The, uh, uh, this is all on your, it's all on your paper somewhere. It's all in the lab somewhere. I've got a little description of what to do each time you take a reading. Uh, but now I got to talk to you. Now you're going to turn to that last page. All right, the first of the last two pages. There's actually uh, two sides to that last page. So we're on the first side that says Beer's Law. And yeah, it's Beer's Law, baby, so I had to talk about it. Funny. Funny, yeah. <laughs> I do have a special affinity for this law. Um, it has nothing to do with beer. It has to do with, I guess, the guy's name. Beer Lambert's Law or Lambert Beer Law. Um, this is one of those laws, by the way. I, I, I never used to, like I said, I, I would just give you the basics I've just given you now. That's all you really needed to know for this lab. But now, because we're doing AP, there could be, quite a matter of fact, I have printed out already for your next test a uh, AP question that I found online. It was a former previous year's question for one of their free response questions. And it has all to do with Beer's Law and how a spectrophotometer or a colorimeter works. All right, what does Beer's Law say? Well, no surprise, it says this. You can write this down. The absorbance of a colored solution is directly proportional to the concentration of that solution. That's not a surprise. It just said that. And it makes complete sense. Now, we are going to have to go pretty quick because of the crazy schedule today and being really short periods. So try to uh, write this down fast. I, I purposely printed out those pictures and graphs so we don't have to. But I need to, even if the bell rings or if people are showing up at the door, I need you guys to, but I need to finish this up first. I'm going to send you a little bit late maybe to other class. All right, that makes sense. The more absorbed, the more uh, color that's absorbed by that sample as the light gets shined through it, the, uh, the stronger the concentration is going to be, okay? To determine that concentration, the exact number of that concentration, you're going to need a standard graph. And I've already prepared one for it. I actually found one online. I used to use an old one that I had, but I thought I'd try this one this year and see if it works. You would, to do a standard concentration, a standard, you would take known solutions of that particular compound, and you would place them in the uh, spec 20, and you would take readings. And then you would plot them. And you have the plot on the paper right below your where you're writing. It looks like that. Okay? This is a classic example. When you, if you graph two things and you see a straight line with a positive slope like that, what does it generally mean? How are they generally related? They're directly proportional, right? And that's what these guys are. Alright? So you did. Four, and this guy, whoever did this one, did four standards. He plotted those. It came out to be a nice straight line. Didn't we just do this? Remember just doing this for the uh, rate of the reaction? Remember? Kinetics? Josh, you weren't here? I guess you were asked. For the problem rate. That was for the, but yeah, I think you were. That was for the, uh, the kinetics uh, lab where we were measuring the rate of the reaction, collecting gas every three seconds, yeah. every three minutes. No, every three, every three buildings. Yeah, he was out. Okay. Well, what we did in that day, and you could do it, by the way, I found a neat, when I was researching this yesterday, uh, to try to find out how much I want to tell you about this, and I, you know, definitely telling you less than one of the videos I watched. Uh, it's a great video, shows you exactly what to do, very similar, how you could plug in the data from your standard curve, get the same exact thing what we did. Remember linear regression line on your graphing calculator, remember doing that? Getting the slope, the slope's going to be basically that what, the piece of information you need. You can plug the other guys in to determine this guy who's unknown. 
But we're not going to do that. We're going to make it a lot easier on ourselves. And by the way, the question on the test, the AP test, does it exactly like I'm going to show you. All you do is you look at the absorbance on your scale. I'm sorry, uh, from your thing that you're going to read tomorrow. You draw a line over, and where it intersects, you would get the concentration all right, of the actual uh, compound. And that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, it makes sense it, without having to get, plug in and get the linear regression line and the slope of this thing. It's a lot easier to just do it that way. Okay? And that's what you're going to do tomorrow. Uh, eventually, by the time you get done with the lab. We have a double period tomorrow, so that's good. All right. So everybody understand that? That makes complete sense, I would hope. Right? Uh, the stronger the concentration, the stronger the absorbance. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Now, continuing with that. Unfortunately, I would have left it there, but we have very little time to get through the rest of this, but I'll do the best I can. Um, actually, Beer's Law has an equation associated with it. And, and this is another one of those cases where the equation has multiple forms. I've seen it actually written at least just yesterday, just looking for an hour and a half yesterday to get this whole thing together. I saw at least three different formats of formula for this equation. The most common one besides what's there is this one. A equals epsilon BC, but I've also said A equals ELC. I mean, there's a lot of possible ways you could have the same thing written, which is uh, very confusing. Why am I giving you this one as the most common one? Because, of course, I looked in the AP exam, and the question, they have the uh, sheet, which I'm going to give to you when we do our last review stuff. The sheet of equations that you'll get to use on the AP exam, it, the format they use is A equals ABC. Now, of course, you got to know what all those things mean. A obviously stands for absorbance, and absorbance is inversely proportional to the, to the percent transmittance. Transmittance got cut off a little bit there at the end. So they're inversely proportional, and that makes sense. As the uh, absorbance increases, the transmittance is going to decrease, and, and vice versa. We need to use, and it will be set for you, but that was one of the questions on the AP exam, the AP question I saw, is where would you want to set that wavelength for your colorimeter or for your spec 20? You'd want to set it at the point of maximum absorbance. It would not be the color of the solution. You all understand that. That's not what it's absorbing. If you see blue, it's not absorbing blue. It's giving off. It's reflecting blue. You see? Okay? It's not absorbing it. All right. You guys have probably seen something similar to that. I bet you Mrs. Uh, AP Bio probably did some stuff with uh, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll has two places where it absorbs really well. And that's how you can tell what wavelengths of light it's most sensitive to and is best for getting uh, you know, photosynthesis to work. Um, anyway. So that's what A means. A is the absorbance. And of course, if I gave you a chart like this, they're already written on your paper here, uh, a, a substance like this, which has a high absorbance around 450, okay, and I believe 450 is in the blue area, is not going to appear blue, okay? That's what you would uh, want to do. You would probably want to set it around. This guy, matter of fact, our solution, which is red, actually, um, the one we're going to use, we're going to have set at 470, so it's not far off of this. I just found this graph just to show you what an absorbance graph would look like versus a transmittance graph. You see what I'm saying? Say, see how they're opposite for the same chemical? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? All right. Uh, neat little thing I also have on there. You, know, you probably can't read all this on yours. I've blown it up a little bit here. Uh, I found this to be pretty fascinating, and I really don't know if I have time to talk about it, but very quickly... Graphing absorbance versus concentration, you get a straight line. That makes complete sense. Graphing transmittance versus concentration, you get a classic example of an inverse proportion. All right. The crazy part about this, I probably found five or six different ways you can have an equation for that. Okay. My two favorites are this because I can show you them. They'll have to write these down. I don't know if I have one of them written down or not. You really aren't going to be doing this equation, but I just wanted to show you this. It's kind of cool. The absorbance is going to equal 2 minus the log of the percent transmittance. You say, what? Where do you get that from? Think about it. It makes complete sense. What? Why 2 minus the log of the percent transmittance? Let's plug in a number we know. Something that has 100% transmittance, how much absorbance happened? Zero, correct? So, 2 minus the log of 100. What's the log of 100? 
No. What's the log of 100? 2. Right? Because remember log, this is base 10 logs. Log is just the power to which 10 is raised, correct? So you see why that equation works? Isn't that crazy? Because therefore 2 minus 2 equals 0. And you say to yourself, th but this also points out a problem with this equation. You say, oh, let's get something like um, another number we could do in our head. Say the percent transmission is only 10%, correct? 10%? 10% uh, would be 2 minus 1, which equals 1. Now, notice you've gone from, set, from uh, uh, 0 to 1. Can I have smaller number than 10% there? Yeah, I can. I can have less than 10% for transmittance, correct? But when I do, what's going to happen to my absorbance? My absorbance is going to be even bigger than 1. And you will see that on your scale. Your scale, actually, when you're reading it, doesn't go from, you might think it's going to go from 0 to 100 and then from uh, one way, and then 0 to 1 the other. It doesn't. The absorbance is actually going to be greater than 1, which is kind of weird. And it's also kind of weird, but we do not use strong concentrations. Very deep colors, very strong concentrations. Once you get up in, in uh, very uh, high absorbance, that no longer is linear. It no longer is a linear relationship, and, it, and you can't use it. That's why we're always going to use such dilute solutions. 0, 0, 0.002 molar and weaker we're going to use as we go on. All right. Um, the other way you can write that same thing, think about it. Would that be the same equation? Yes, it would. You see why? It's negative because I'm now divide, I've got a, a fraction. I'm dividing by 100. That makes it one, over 100, a decimal. All right. So negative log of that would also equal the absorbance. You don't believe me? Try it. All right. It's kind of cool. I thought that was neat. But anyway, we don't have time to really go over all that. I've got to give you the rest of the things about the equation. Molar absorptivity is little a. That's this little a here, or epsilon here. I know you're going to be a little late for your next class, but I'll send you late and say you want to yell at me, they can. Um, epsilon, or little a, is the molar absorptivity. It's a measure of how much light a sample absorbs. And that amount is basically a constant at a particular, um, for a particular substance in a particular wavelength. It's going to be a number. That's the number you're going to get if you were to graph the equation and get the slope of the line. That's what you would get there. That's what it would be equal to. Okay? It basically is the slope of that linear equation graph of absorbance versus concentration. We are not going to do that. Okay? We could. I could show you how. If you're interested, I'll show you the website, uh, the web uh, video that shows you exactly how to do it. But it's doing very much what we did to get the uh, slope or the rate of the kinetics lab we did with the oxygen and uh, potassium iodide hyperperoxide lab. All right, so that's molar absorptivity. That's what the little a is. And you would get that by graphing it. And it's basically going to be a constant or a number, a unitless number. The path length would also matter. Hey, guys, would it make a difference if it's going through this test tube or through this test tube? Absolutely. Absolutely. If that light's going through here or if it's going through here, with the same stuff in it, why does that make a difference? Because here, it's going to look darker. It's going to look darker for that guy. It's going to absorb more particles. There's more of it. So the path length is basically the distance the light has to travel through that solution. And that solution, therefore, has to be placed in the identical cuvette each time. A cuvette is a special test tube, and here he is right here. Special test tube. Like this. Looks like this. You're going to use these tomorrow? Again, I'll show you how. If you were to measure the disk, by the way, most cubettes nowadays are square, I've noticed. The ones that I think this is a, uh, Rothery has, and the ones I saw online, they're all square. They're all fit into a square one. This one's round, but either way, they're one centimeter wide. Okay, so that is our value. It's going to be a one. We have a one centimeter wide for a reason. It makes my calculation easier, right? I have a one in there. If I had it going through a larger cuvette, all right, that would make it, the solution absorb more. That just makes sense. So, the sub, what, what does it depend on? What does your, um, how, how, what is your reading that your absorbance depend on? It depends on what stuff's in it, how red or blue or green it is. It depends on how far it has to travel through that stuff, the path length. And it depends of course, on the concentration, all right, how much of it's there, the actual concentration in molarity, based on the molarity. Okay? All right. Now, oh, 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 stop. I want to show you this last graph here just before you go. Okay? Because I, I'm, I'm recording. I'll get out of here in a second. All right. All of these you could do a calculation with. If I have time on Friday, I'll show you how or do one. But for the most part, um, we, we won't need to use this because we're going to interpolate the graph just by drawing a line across and down. 
And that's the graph we're going to use. That's the graph you guys are going to use tomorrow. It has the absorbance at 470 nanometers, and it has the concentration. By the way, these are all times 10 to the 4 to times 10 to the 5th power, 5th power in this case. All right? You guys need to cross out the graph that I have been using in the past. That's on the second page. Okay, you can do that right now. Put it cross so you don't use it wrong. That's the correct one. This is the one that looks like this on the last page. You turn to the second page, the very second page, cross that graph out. This that graph is not, yeah, we're not going to use that one. We're not going to use that one. Okay, we're going to use this one. What will you do tomorrow? Tomorrow you'll get all your readings. You'll get your absorbances. You'll draw a line over and down, and you'll know what your concentrations are based on that graph. And that will help us finish the equilibrium problem. All right, that's it. I know that was quick, but you got...